What's up guys? Today we're gonna to get into the Atari input and output system in assembly language. We're gonna get our feet wet and talk about how we get data into the computer and out of the computer through the Atari's subsystem called the IOCB. So stick around, it's gonna be good. In any computer system, the terms input and output refer to communication between the microprocessor and any external device. A device such as a keyboard, a screen, a printer, a disk drive, a tape recorder, or any other similar peripheral. There are new devices being created every day for the Atari that allow you to emulate the traditional devices such as the disk drive or the cassette units with modern hardware. One aspect of the Atari system which makes it unique and from a programmer's point of view so easy to use is that all external devices are handled identically and are differentiated only by changing minor aspects of the input-output routine. Inside the Atari operating system, there are a number of vectors predetermined that you can jump to in your assembly language program to, to perform input and output on specific device types. Here you can see a list of the addresses and the common names that are used to associate those addresses with the type of input-output performed. The vector that we're going to use in today's example is the CIOV, the Central Input Output Vector. We're going to be using this vector to output information, text to the screen. So the next thing we need to talk about is the IOCB, or the Input Output Control Block. This is a section of memory that we're going to set up as programmers to tell the Atari which device we want to use and what information is to be passed. Each input output control block requires 16 bytes of information and there's a total of eight input output control blocks or eight IOCDs that are available for the programmer to use. So there are 16 bytes for each IOCB and each successive IOCB is a 16-bit offset from its prior IOCB. So as we can see in this diagram, the IOCB block number 2 starts at memory address PEX 350. Here are the 8 IOCB blocks shown with their specific offsets in memory. So let's just take a quick look at the 16 bytes of the IOCB and more importantly let's just talk about the ones that we're going to be using today for our example of outputting text to the screen. So let's talk about the first byte of the IOCB block and that is the ICCOM or command byte. For our example we're going to set our command byte to 3. Open the device. The next operation we're going to take is by filling the 2 byte buffer address that stores the address of the buffer that we're going to be using to output or input. Once we set the buffer address, we're going to tell the input output control block the length of our buffer. Again, low byte, high byte. The last byte we need to fill for our write to screen is the IC auxiliary byte, which we're going to set to 08 hex, which means open the device for write operations. Alright, so let's get down to some practicality and let's take a look at some code here. So I'm in my Mac 65 assembler debugger environment here. This is what we talked about in the last video. If you're not familiar with this environment, Check out the link above and make sure you watch that video. It'll give you an introduction into this environment. Get your little feet wet um, with respect to the assembler editor that we're using here. So in any event, I'm gonna load up a sample program that I prepared for this video. It's called hellow.w.asm, which stands for hello world. So let's go ahead and break this program down. Let's list the first few lines here and see if we can um, decipher what's going on here. So this first line, number 10, uses a directive um, that we haven't talked about yet, but 
this directive is called the dot title directive and that basically titles this source code listing and you can call it whatever you want. It's just a way of putting a heading in your source code for this particular uh, listing. Um, we talked about the OPT directive last time. I won't go into that again. Uh, we know about the memory start directive here. The start equals 4000. This is going to be the memory location um, that we're going to start our program at. Now, we're going to define some constants here um, or some labels in the beginning of the program to help us um, refer to some values by name. So ELL stands for end of line. That's in hex 9B. That's what the Atari uses to determine the end of a line when reading and writing to an output device or input device, reading from an input device. Um, this right here is just a comment. We're going to set up the ICCOM block. Okay, this should be called the IOCB. I think that's a better label for that, the IOCB, input output control block. So let's go ahead and define some contents for our control block and I'll go ahead and list 60 on now. Let's see if we can get these constants up here by themselves. All right, so what we've done here is basically to find a bunch of constants. Now, a lot of these constants that are, or these labels that I'm defining here are going to be reused in all kinds of different code they're going to be using when you're talking to peripherals on the Atari. So it's good to have these set aside in a separate file that you can bring into your source code any type you, anytime you start a new program. So we're going to define the open label as hex 3, write is 08, put record 9, put character B, close C, and this is going to be the actual start of the input output control block here, 340. If you remember earlier in the slides when I was showing you the input output control block byte structure, the first input output control block starts in memory at 340, and every successive control block after that is an offset of 16 bytes you know, from the first 16 bytes to the second, 16 bytes to the third, and so on. So the first block starts at 340, so we're always gonna define our first input control block values. So input control block IOCB is gonna be 340. The, in, the input control block command is 342. The byte address, low byte, the buffer address, excuse me, low byte and high byte is gonna be 344, 345. The buffer length, low byte and high byte, is going to be 348 and 349, respectively. The auxiliary 1 and 2 bytes are going to be 340A and 340B. And the vector that we're going to be using today to actually do the actual output into the screen is located at E456. So from 60 to 190, I'm just dividing some constants that we're going to be using uh, to point out to memory locations where we're gonna be actually assigning values before we actually make the call to output the information. So let's look at line 190 through 900. Now, <clears throat> I've got a device name here, a label, and this directive here, we haven't talked about yet, but we'll go ahead and talk about it. The byte directive allows you to set up a continuous amount of bytes at the specific memory location in the source code, in, in the object code in memory, by whatever you want here separated by either, you can either put the bytes in quotation marks as a string, or you can separate the bytes with a comma and then just use hex values individually. Like we've already defined the EOL as 9B, up, or up higher in the source code listing, so we know that EOL, end of line, is a 9B. But this particular label dev name, uh, the Atari uses specific um, device identifiers to represent specific devices. E is the screen. If I were to put a D here, that would be a disk drive. Um, P would be for the printer, and C would be for the cassette. So we'll just keep it simple today. We'll leave this at E. Uh, the text that we're going to put to the screen, I've defined as another label here called My Text. Again, we're using the byte directive to set up a an array, if you will, of bytes, and I've got it in quotation marks, hello world, terminated by the end of line. 
So just for reference, let's count the number of bytes that we have here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, plus the end of line, which is 13. That'll come in later. Um, and then I've got a label here called open screen. And this is where we're actually going to do our first uh, input output um, command, if you will, to open the screen, all right? So when you're dealing with the IOCB or the IO control blocks, you're referencing the actual control block indirectly through an index. And we're gonna, in this case, we're gonna be using the X register as our index. So if you remember, ICCOM is defined as 342, okay? 342 is our first input output control block command. And I'll throw the slide up real quick just to show you that. 342 is the first IOCB command um, memory address. But we're not gonna be using the first IOCB. The first IOCB is normally reserved for the operating system to be interacting with the screen. In other words, what we're seeing here on our display is most likely being written to and updated by the editor assembler or by the Mac 65 editor um, through IOCB zero. So we wanna use one of the other IOCBs. And in my case here in this demonstration, we're gonna be using IOCB number two. And hence the offset here that I have, 20, as you remember, every 16 bytes from the first IOCB block will put you at the next successive IO control block. So by setting my X register at 20, which is actually 32 in decimal, when I say store ICCOM, let me put this back where it should be, ICCOM comma X, uh, what I'm actually doing is I am storing this in IC control block number two, okay? So let's take a quick look back up here. ICCOM 342, if we wanted to reference the second, or the, actually the, you're talking about a zero index, so ICCOM zero is 342, one would be 352, number two would be 362. So by doing with an offset of 20, we're actually referencing 362 like this, okay? But we can't, we can't reference the memory directly. I learned that the hard way <laughs> a long time ago. You have to use indirect indexing because when we actually call the vector to put the information onto the screen, the vector knows which actual control block to reference by this X register, okay? So we really, be, we really need to be using the X register for indexing. And what we're doing here again, we're loading the accumulator with the open command or the open token, which in our case is here, number three. Okay, so we're telling our control block that we wanna open our command open. So we're storing that in control block number two, because we're offset by 32, 32 bytes. Does everybody see how that works? Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to tell the control block that we're using um, what buffer we wanna use to actually, uh, or we actually wanna tell it what device we wanna use to actually output our information. In our case, we've set up a dev name called E colon with an end of line terminator. Now the operating system knows that when it sees that particular um, device name, it knows that we're trying to open the screen. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take and load the accumulator with the load byte of the dev name. And the way you do that is dev name is actually here um, this label is actually set up to these three bytes in memory, okay? And you'll see that when we assemble this, I'll be able to show you the memory address where it's actually um, compiled into. But by saying LDA dev name and 255, we're basically masking off the high byte 
from the memory address and we're isolating it down to the low byte. So the accumulator is gonna end up with the low byte of the memory address of dev name. And we're gonna store that into ICBAL, which stands for the buffer address low byte in IC block number two. And we're gonna store the low byte of that screen address. And then we're gonna take the high byte and the way you grab the high byte is you load the accumulator with the memory address divided by 256 and that will return just the high byte of that particular um, memory address and we're gonna store that in the high byte of the input control uh, buffer address. So we've told the block we wanna open, that's our command. The address of what we're opening is the screen now the next thing we need to do is we need to set the auxiliary byte of the input control block to the actual token write. Now we have write defined up here as 08. And that tells the, uh, the block that we're gonna write to this device, okay? So very easily, what we're doing is we're loading the accumulator again with the write token, and we're storing that in the auxiliary byte. Now the auxiliary two byte is not used in this operation, but you should set it to zero um, even when you're not using it. So we're gonna load the accumulator with zero and we're gonna store that into the auxiliary number two byte. And here's our first piece of action, if you will. We're gonna jump the subroutine, that's what JSR stands for, to CIOV. Now remember, we define CIOV as E456, and that is the vector in the Atari operating system that does input and output to the screen. So in a nutshell, what we're doing here is we're telling the device, we're telling the input control block number two, we wanna open the screen for write, and we call the CIOV, and that basically opens the screen and clears it and gets it ready for us to write to it. Okay, so lines 230, line 230 through 380 opens the screen. Okay, let's go down and take a look at 400. Now 400, we're telling the next command for the control block. Now that we've got the screen open, we're gonna now tell the input control block our next command is gonna be put record. And put record means that we are gonna write some data to the block. So we're gonna use the put record token, which is defined as 09, right here, okay? We're gonna put that 09 as our next command in the control block. So now the control block knows that we're gonna actually put something to the screen, we need to tell it what we're gonna to put to the screen. And this is we're gonna next load the, again, the input control block buffer address, low and high byte. We're gonna set that to the text that I assigned to my text, which we have up here as our sample text, hello world. So my text here is a byte array of hello world characters terminated by end of line. All right, so now what we're doing is we're assigning the low byte of that buffer to the low byte of the buffer address and we're setting the high byte of that buffer to the high byte of that address. So now what we're gonna do is we need to set the length of this buffer because remember we told it where our text is but it doesn't know how long or how big it is, okay? Now the nice thing about the put record command or token is that if you set the buffer length, low and high bytes, to FF as the high byte and 00 as the low byte, it's gonna print that entire buffer until it sees the end of line, okay? Now there's another mode that we can use which is called put ch, put an individual character, okay? Um, but I'm not gonna use that one because that would require us here to put the exact number of bytes that we're trying to print to the screen. So that would, in this case, it would be 
I think I said 13, so this would be zero, zero, um, and then an OD. Um, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna go ahead and use the put record and let that do its work. So we've assigned the text buffer. We've given it the FF00, which means print till the end of line. And then what we're gonna do is, in preparation for this continuing to loop, I'm loading 255 in the accumulator. I'm storing that in the 2FC, which you've probably seen in my prior um, assembly language listings. Is It's a keyboard uh, get call in the operating system that gets the key that's, be, that's been pressed. So I load a 255 in there, which means there's no key being pressed before we start our loop. And our loop basically is going to jump to subroutine CIOV. So let me get a little bit more of that up on the screen here. You can see we're at the end of our program here. So I'm loading 255 into the keyboard get buffer. I'm storing that, and then we're starting our loop. It says, so this basically calls the COV, CIOV vector a second time, this time actually putting the message to the screen. It does that instantly. And then what I'm doing here is I'm loading the 2FC memory address, which is the shadow address of, the, of any keys that are being pressed, and I'm saying, if it's anything other than 255, meaning the keyboard has key has been pressed, quit the program. Otherwise, jump back to the loop and print the screen again. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna print hello world, check for a keyboard press. If no keyboard press was detected, go back up and print hello world again. So it's gonna hello world, hello world, hello world, hello world, hello world, hello world. If I press a key on the keyboard, it's gonna quit the program. All right, so without further ado, let's assemble this code. Now remember, we're assembling this into address 4000. Now, I want you to be careful, because now we're doing some, some assembly language code where we actually have some labels and some, some memory that's being set up before we actually get to any executable assembly language code. So. In our past programs they had, we had worked on, they were so simple that at memory address 4000, that's where we would start our program. But in this case, since we have all this setup and this bytes set up in the beginning of the code, we're not actually being executed at 4000, we're gonna be executing a little bit further down in 4000. And what I mean by that is if we assemble, and you see here, we actually have not actually assembled any code, ob object code in the memory until we reach 4010, right here, 4010, which is our Lodex register with uh, hex 20. So just keep that in mind, you're not gonna execute up here at 4000, because 4000 at this point is just containing bytes of information, which ends up being our screen device and the text that we're displaying. So let's go into our debugger, DDT, and let's set our program counter to 4000, which is the memory where we have started our, our source code. And you can see here at 4000, there's really no valid commands because again, those are the bytes that have been set aside for the screen device name and our text message. So if we go down using our arrow key, we can see that our program actually really starts at 4010. Okay, so just for laughs, I'm gonna go ahead and set the program counter at 4010 just to make sure that everything is kosher. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start executing this machine code at 4010. And the way we do that is we type G, 4010, and we press enter. So what this should do is it should open up a screen, clear the screen, set all those buffers and the commands for the in input um, output control block that we had designed and start printing hello world. So let's see what happens. And there we go. And you can see this is just going in a constant loop, printing hello world, hello world, until I press a key, that takes me back to the debugger. Now if we get out of the debugger, we get back to our screen, which we can see our source code. Now, obviously, as you can see, this is a heck of a lot more code than it would take a, an equivalent program in basic which would look like this. Uh, how can I press enter without it actually executing? Well, I can't, but I'm gonna go ahead and fool it. 
So what would normally take two lines in basic, <laughs> let's renumber this by line numbers of one. Can I do by one? Yeah, let's do one. I think I can do one, rename one comma one to actually start it off with one, yeah. Oops. We don't want that, do we? Looks like I blew out my, my title line, but that's okay. Be careful when you're renumbering. <laughs> let's see how many line numbers it took in assembly language to actually do that. So roughly 65 lines in assembly language of what it took to do in two lines of basic. However, I want you to always remember this. This program is gonna run probably a thousand times faster than it does in basic, okay? There's a lot more setup that has to be done here in assembly language, but the speed and performance that you gain in the end is worth the effort. And in some cases, it's necessary because when you're writing games and you're doing high-speed graphics, moving sprites around the screen, uh, actually, believe it or not, reading and writing files to the disk drive, you're not gonna get the speed and the performance you need from basic, all right? So anyway, this is your introduction to input-output control blocks. And um, it probably doesn't make all that much sense right now if this is your first time looking at this. Um, but if you look at the, the book that I, that I referenced in the beginning of the video, Atari Roots, or if you go out and Google and you do some searching for input-output control blocks on the Atari, there's a lot of good articles out there that talk about this subject about opening uh, control blocks and using them to read and write to the screen and also disk drives and cassettes. And take your time, type in the examples. I'll have this source code up on my website, www8 bit and more, hello w.asm. Type it into your assembler, compile it, assemble it, run it, play with some of the values, change the text. Um, and next time we come back, we're gonna do some disk operations. We'll do like a similar program, but we'll use, we'll read and write uh, to the disk drive. And as we continue through this series, you'll become more and more familiar with the control block and how to use it. And um, like I said, it's very easy. Once you understand that you're basically picking the control block that you're gonna use, you're opening that control block in a specific mode for reading and writing. You're setting the buffer for what you're gonna read or write, the length of that buffer, of what, from what you're gonna read or write. Decide whether you're gonna put a record or read a record from that block, and then actually call the vector that performs the work, okay? So it's, it's really those few steps, but they just have to be set up correctly um, initially, and you're good to go. And um, that's it for this video. I didn't wanna make it too long. Um, again, just an introduction to input output control blocks. If you like what you're seeing, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel because we've got a lot of good videos coming up. They're going to be talking about programming the Atari and assembly language. Um, so anyway, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Go Atari.